So the title of the lesson is, He Lives an Unapproachable Life. Mm -hmm. He Lives an Unapproachable Life. Look at 1 Peter 2.22. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When, he, when they hurled their insults at him, he did not hesitate. He did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. For by his wounds you have been healed, and for you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. Now listen to this, guys. This is who we're following. Do you guys understand what you have in God? He lives in unapproachable light. Look in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6. In verse 11. And point number one is fight for the light or die. Fight for the light or die. See, Jesus died for us to be in the light. So why wouldn't we be willing to fight or die? Fight to death for the light. We're in the light. We, Jesus says in 14, Luke 14, 33, any one of you who does not give up everything you have cannot be my disciple. Right? What does that mean? Well, that means your life as well, literally. Jesus is saying... You need to be willing to die if that's the call, and God makes the call. But that's what he's saying, give up everything. Look in um, 1 Timothy 6, 11. You guys there? Yeah. But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Let's just stop right here and break this down. You man, flee from all this. Is this just like a game? No, this is like life or death. And this is the way we don't see it sometimes. Flee. Not just hang around. Turn and run from anything that's going to cause you. The way to sin or death. Yeah. And it says pursue. So there's, there's total action verbs. It's to be wise and humble and run and, 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 and from anything that's sinful. And then pursue means go after. Almost can be seek God with all your heart, going after the character of Christ. Not just one, I hope I get it, I'm praying for it. No, pray and then behave and go after it, change it. Yeah. He says fight. You guys, I don't know if you've ever boxed or sparred in a sport. It's not easy. If you box... Uh, we know that OJ, OJ and Jaleesa, OJ's down in Miami, he shared, and I didn't know, but he was a Golden Glove boxer, and I was talking about him, I've never done anything like that. I've done martial arts and boxing when I was younger, and if you ever put gloves on, even in the backyard, just for fun, you start swinging, even if you're in a boxer, in 30 seconds to 45 seconds, you're dying of breath, <laughs> unless you're a trained dude. You know, you see the guys in the movies with the, with the, with the jump ropes, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, whoa, there's cranking. You know how good their air is? You gotta be in such good shape. And he's saying, fight. Fight the good fight. You think this is just easy? You guys just read a little Bible and skip it, do da and you're going to make it? You're saved by grace, but you got to fight. Your sinful nature is still saying, kiss my butt, God. Mm. Honestly, and you're not saying that out loud now. You, you're putting it to death every day. That's why he says, deny yourself, carry your cross daily. Why would we have to do that after we're saved? Why would we have to carry our cross if it's like a magical potion God gave us? Why would we have to deny ourselves if Jesus died for us? Wouldn't we just automatically go, this is just obvious. I'm just, sin is so gross. I'm just going to be, it's just so naturally like Jesus. No, he says you got to fight. This is talking to saved people. You can't even, you can't even stay saved without the spirit of God at baptism. You'd have to have a heart change, but you get the Holy Spirit. Why does he give you the Holy Spirit? Just to carry it around and act spiritual and brag about how much you have God? Or no, no, to show it by your deeds, to prove that you're different, to show God, to show Jesus' character more and more in your life. We never arrive. That's the point. We're striving to grow. Let's keep reading. In the sight, verse 13, in the sight of God who gives life to everything, and Christ Jesus, who while testifying before punch butt, made the good confession, I charge you. To keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time. God, the blessed, the only ruler, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, who alone is immortal, who lives in an unapproachable light. Let's just stop right there. I'm going to keep reading. But he lives in unapproachable light. 
Do you understand if you're a baptized disciple, you go from darkness into light? Yes. You are allowed to connect with God in what Jesus says is impossible. He's unapproachable. Now, when we die in the light, we're going to be able to go and see God. And he says right now he's in unapproachable light. You understand what had to happen? Jesus died, but you understand how precious that is that you're in the light? You know, you know how amazing that is that you can be in the light? Yeah. It says he lives in unapproachable light whom no one has seen or can see. To him be honor and might forever. Amen. Command those who are rich in the present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain. Put, but put their hope in God, which richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Timothy. Guard what has been entrusted to you, to your care. Turn away from godless chatter and the opposing ideas of what is falsely called knowledge, which some have professed and in doing so have departed from the faith. Grace be with you all. Unapproachable light, guys. It's incredible. I've seen the scripture a lot, and I start thinking about the light. I was like, oh my gosh. Mm. Yeah, we're baptized. We had to get godly sorrow, and we, we made that vow, and that's why he, he, he doesn't want you to mostly make it. He, he, you come out of that water and you're dead serious. You're forgiven for all your sins, but you are striving to live. And you know that cause. And, and some of you guys that have, it, it just became disciples or, or you understand that's why you're asked a lot. How's your relationship with God? God going even afterwards. How, how's your time with God? How's your time with God? It, it's reading the Bible. It's praying. It's, it's connecting. It's believing. It's growing. It's, it's so much. The most happens before you even see people. In your own time with God. If you don't develop that, church is part of God's plan. The church isn't to force feed you. You're supposed to be walking with God. And, 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 and that's why to not do it is just a stubborn, prideful attitude. Because you go, oh, I forgot. Or, you know, what the heck? Well, do you guys understand what's going on? Yeah. If you can't read, we'll read to you and get you in a reading school. But you, everybody can read. So that's the issue. Come You're on. not doing it because it's not important to you. Or, or you find something else important. So you got to pray even there. Make it important. Yeah. You guys with me on this? This is serious stuff. Yeah. So look in uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26. And you understand, hopefully you see these actions that unfortunately have to be taken are godly and biblical. And in the first century church, this was normal stuff. I mean, if you think about God's punishments of people, remember when Cain... When God came before Cain and Abel, he said, why, is your, why are you downcast? Why are you angry? <clears throat> to Cain, right? Yeah. He goes, if you do what's right, you'll be accepted. If you do not do what's right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. So right there, God's given the guy total, total option of choice. All the power is in Cain's lap. <clears throat> why are you angry? Why are you downcast? It's easy. Because when you're not doing well and you're in sin, if you don't change your attitude, you're defiant, you're grumpy, you have a bad attitude. Yeah. He says, just change, dude. If you do what's right, you're all in. I'm right here with you. You're all in. Mm -hmm. What's he do? He goes out and does exactly the opposite and takes it deeper and kills. What was his punishment? He was banished from God's Garden of Eden for life. He wasn't just put out for 60 days. You're done. Mm -hmm. He banished him. Cain goes, this is more than I can handle. They're going to kill me. And he says, no, no, I'll put a mark on you. Which means God somehow will make it make a, a, a hedge where it will work out where no one will kill you. But you will be a restless wanderer for the rest of his life. You know what it means to be restless and wandering? That means you have no security. You're insecure. You're full of fear. You're anxious. Have you ever been anxious and fearful and hard to sleep and scared to death? Sometimes people call it an anxiety attack or whatnot. It's terrible. How about never being able to be cured from that restless wanderer? That was a life sentence from God. Tell me if he doesn't punish it serious. He got a chance to not go there, and God said, you're banished for life. Hmm. Yeah. Even Moses' sister was given leprosy for a week and sent outside the camp, and she wasn't sent a week. She got struck with leprosy and put her out of camp for seven days. And then she came back, and God didn't tell her, but then took the leprosy away. Because she spoke up in front of other people and opposed Moses' leadership. Boom! That's the reference of God we need to get. 
In, in uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we receive the knowledge of truth, no sacrifice of sins is left. But only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think someone need, deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified him, who has insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, It is mine to avenge, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of of the living God. Well, you know what? If you're humble and repentant and you know you need grace and you don't take it, it's an awesome thing to die and fall in the hands of the Lord. He's saying it's a dreadful thing if you're doing this. To live. Now, can you imagine having a man tied or just as a dude? Say, say, could you imagine, if you ever seen like news footage or having a guy that's in a fight or being beat up by a bunch of guys and he goes down and he's already suddenly unconscious and people are continuing to kick him in the head? That's what, that's what God's saying you're doing to him. You're deliberately trampling on his face. He's out, he's nailed to the cross, and you're like, in his face, smashing his nose. And that's what you're doing. You're trampling. That's not funny, dudes. It's not, what are you laughing at? It's not funny. It's not funny right now. It's not, be mature. It's not funny. I'm talking about God Almighty walking on his face because of your sins. It's not, it's not sixth grade. So freaking wake up. This is walk or die. This is walk in the light or die. This is not playground time. I'm, the, I'm going to heaven. Who's, who's going with me? So we can have all the fun work, but this is, this is not going to be tolerated. Defiant, deliberate deceit and contempt. You disrespect God. You don't repent. You're going to be warned. Same thing goes for me. Just be humble. That's all we need to do. I'm going to say I need help. Okay? Deliberately walking on the face of Jesus. He's on the ground. Can you imagine trampling? You're trampling. It says deliberately trampling over his face. And then that's when it says it's a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Yeah. Now look what it says in verse 22. Remember those earlier days after you had received the light. Remember, God lives in an unapproachable light. How did you get in that light? How did I get in that light? We don't deserve it. God said if you respond and understand you're a sinner and understand I know you're a sinner, he says, and understand you're going to have struggles and you are going to sin again, but you're going to be open and humble and continuing to go, God, help me. You see what I'm saying? That's what that is. He says, remember when you got baptized. Do you guys remember? When you receive the light. You know when you're saved. I was baptized in November 3rd, 1993. I know. I can still see the pool and the people around singing and, and rejoicing when I went under. Happy for me because they knew what I was doing. Mm -hmm. I still can see it. I still remember Jerry's Deli I went out to on Ventura Boulevard in California with the brothers that studied the Bible with me. I can see it. You know, I got a towel, put my clothes back, we went out afterwards and I was saved with them. And they're like, you're saved, dude. It was just so hard to come out. I know I am, but man, you know, if you're studying the Bible, just blow away. That's when I received the light. And then he says, look at these, well, these people, when they received the light, they endured, when they endured, when you endured in, in a great conflict full of suffering. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult, persecution. Other times you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You suffered along with those in prison and joyfully ex accepted the confiscation of your property. Because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. Where do you get confidence? You get godly confidence from, from the cross. From realizing I'm nothing, but I'm going to be everything. I'm going to be my best I can for God, but God gets the credit. He says it will be richly rewarded. Look at that. Stay the course. And then he says, you need to persevere. Not just you might. It's going to be hard at times. Not because it's awesome. It's because your character is going to want to quit. Your, your attitude is going to want to walk you out. Your, your, your old school buddies. Your, maybe your past. Maybe your family. Everybody's going to try to talk you out of it. And you need to persevere over it. Yes, yes. So that when you've done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. And look in verse 37. For in just a little while. Doesn't say just a while, a little while. And that was written 2,000 years ago, so it's really a little while. And the Bible says, 
A day is like a thousand years of the Lord. So two days, two and a half days, two, a little over two days ago, Jesus was crucified in God's time, so to speak. So we don't know when it's coming. He says, in just a little while, he who is coming will not delay. Come on, come back. It could end right now. The roof could, it, it, we, it says there's going to be a trumpet. This is going to happen. Everybody in the whole world that's alive and dead is all going to stop. And everybody's going to know this is it. And in verse 38, but my righteous one will live by faith, and I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. This, this is God. But we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but we are those who have faith and are saved. See the battle? It's real. In fact, it's so real you should be excited because a lot of us grew up going to these churches that just didn't teach nothing and you were bored and you fell asleep and you saw your dad fall asleep. And you're like, why do I go to church? That's what most of the world is. Why go to church? It doesn't do anything. Because you, you were deceived all the time by Satan. So was I. You mean to be in a church that teaches us how to get into the unapproachable light and then respect it. Because God is here if we uphold his way of life and truth. Are you with me? Yeah. Look at um, Matthew. Or, I'm sorry. Look at. Uh, so in unapproachable light, what we're talking about, it's. The return of Christ is mentioned in verse 14. If you go back to uh, 1 Timothy 6, I want to look at verse 14. I want to dissect this because this is very powerful about what he says. In verse 14, he says, I charge you, right before verse 14 in uh, 1 Timothy 6, I charge you to keep his, this command without spot or blame until the peer, appearing of our Lord. See that? I charge you to keep his command. And... To the return of Christ mentioned in verse 14 serves as the primary motive for fulfilling his command. Look at verse 14. Keep his command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the motivation. The motivation is he's coming back. I'm going to stand before him. And he emphasizes on the timing of this verse. And it's consistent with Jesus' statement that only the Father knows the day and time of the hour. We're not going to go there, but in Matthew 24, 36, it says, No one knows the day or the hour that he returned. And it says you should be, be aware like, uh, like what, because uh, like it, it's going to come like a thief in the night, which means you don't know. When, you, when, you're, when you're burglarized and you wake up and everything's gone, you didn't know. You didn't catch him. He got you. So... We have to understand that the proper time is God's own time. Paul stresses in verse 16, three divine godly attributes. God is immortal, invisible, and unapproachable. Look at that. God is immortal, invisible, and unapproachable. You see that in verse 16? Who alone is immortal, who lives in approachable life, unapproachable life, and whom no one has seen. Wow. So... God is invisible because he is unapproachable by sinful humanity. Mm -hmm. It is Christ alone who enables us to approach him. You understand, when you go to prayer, it's not a, it, 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 a lot had to happen for you to be able to pray. Even if you think, man, it, it, God couldn't hear your prayer. He could work in your heart if you were seeking him. But he, you, you weren't connected in a right person. When he started to call you and you started to seek him, he would work in your life and respond. But you weren't saved until you seriously had a heart change. Yeah. So this is what's at stake. Look at Hebrews 4, 16. This is powerful, guys. Because you know what? We need to be reminded how grateful we are. I'm like, I, I, I'm in awe of how, you know, when even doing this lesson, I was like, man, this is good for me totally. Because I need to stay so grateful for anything. And the more grateful you are, the less you find to complain about because you cannot believe that you're unapproachable. You're in with God and, and where God is in approachable light, you're in the light. Mm -hmm. Look in uh, uh, Hebrews 4, 16. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So, isn't that pretty powerful? Let us approach 
The throne of grace. How do you do that? You pray. It's prayer. You're not a throne. You're not walking up to no throne right now. This isn't talking about judgment. This is talking about before judgment. Now, a judgment, because of your prayer life and your honesty with God and man, then when you die, you'll feel confident before God in judgment because it's not on your own. But you were humble and you took the blood of Christ serious and you strive not to sin. And when you sinned, you absolutely had godly sorrow and you changed and left that sin in the dust. You should always be growing. If you're not growing, you're dying. In everything. Every principle. Not just spiritual. So, approach the throne of grace is how's your prayer life? Because you're on your knees praying. That's why I'm on my knees, because I can't even believe I can approach. I can speak confidently to God, not arrogantly, not like I'm better than anybody. Just, oh my gosh, because of Christ, I can speak. To Him, to God. Who's in unapproachable light. I still can't see him, but I can speak to him. And he says he hears me because of my confidence in the blood of Christ, which will call me to have godly sorrow when I approach him. That's incredible, guys. Isn't that incredible? Mm -hmm. Let's look at, uh, so, if we, if we see these, these the, 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 the approach, and then, and then if we look at, so here we are, God. God is invisible because we are still sinful. You remember when Jesus died, raised from the dead, and said, no one touch me. Remember they wanted to touch him. Mm -hmm. We're still saved, but we're still in sin. We're saved because of the blood of Christ. We're sinners that are saved. We're saved sinners yeah. because of our heart and our faith in the blood of Jesus. So, if you look in uh, verse, look at John chapter 14, verse 9. Because see, this is where the grace gets to the song, why the guy, and I don't think he just sat down and went, what am I going to name this song? I think the guy actually was thinking through on grace when he looked at his life. And I think when I start talking about this, what happened one time? I was talking about the grace, and I was talking about my life, and I just went, grace. And I was talking to somebody, and I go, it's amazing. And I'm like, that's probably how that guy named it. Because I was so, I was talking about how grateful I am for grace. And I go, that's amazing. And I went, amazing grace. That's probably what the dude was thinking when he was thinking about how he, like, it's hard to believe he could be forgiven. And that guy was a slave boat captain that was responsible for tens of thousands of slaves that died on the, on the boats from Africa to here that were stocked up, defecating on each other, being beaten and dying of starvation and dehydration and thrown over the boat because they were dead and they just, with chains, and drowned them. He killed thousands. It's the guy who wrote that song Amazing Grace is that's the guy. I forget his name, but it's in, the, it's in the Wikipedia. The worst of the worst. It's hard. It would be hard to believe you could be forgiven for something. And he went on as like a, like a barefoot, just death to guy because he didn't feel he deserved anything. He was like a, became a complete servant uh, to, every, to people in a monastery. He just, and he went blind. And he just, uh, but it said that he wrote that. And he, it was too hard to swallow that. He couldn't believe, he couldn't, you know, he, it was so amazing. He couldn't, he didn't deserve it. Mm. And we don't deserve it. In John 14, 9, it says, Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? See, Jesus is visible here. Tangible image of the invisible God. A tangible image. That's for us. You can say, well, wait a minute. I wasn't with him. Well, it makes it clear, but the faith God gives us that we're blessed even more because we did not see, but we still believe. It says that in John. So God has enabled us to have enough faith to go, oh my gosh. So we see the image of a flesh, man, human being, God, Jesus, walking and interacting. And we, we read these and you can really get between the lines with your faith and understand in your own heart and watch the word of God living and active move your heart with a tangible human being example of what God calls you to be. That's incredible. And he is the complete revelation of what God is like. Jesus explains to Philip, who wanted to see, who wanted to see, listen, who wanted to see the Father, that to know Jesus is to know God. Yes. The search for God for truth and reality ends in Christ. And the last two are related. According to, let's look at Exodus 33. You guys with me on this? Yeah. This isn't 
I'm not down on you at all. I'm, I'm just getting us to get in touch with what's the battle. We gotta be heightened at times because we can, we can, we can actually be fooled by the biblical grace and let Satan slide in a grace that's not really grace. Yeah. Meaning we just give ourselves a pass when we could have not, when we could have done, we could have done what's right. We just, God's okay. And then eventually it becomes this old senile grandpa that just lets you do anything. I love you. I understand. That's not God. That's not God. Uh, it says in Exodus 33, uh, pick it up verse 12. It says, Moses said to the Lord, you have been telling me, leave these people, but you've not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. But if you're pleased with me, teach me your way so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation's your people. The Lord replied, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Now, check this out. Doesn't it say somewhere that he'll be with you always to the very end of the age? Mm -hmm. So that would say, I would pretty much say that's his presence with you. Doesn't it somewhere else say, and even Timothy, I think it's 1 Timothy 4, in the presence of God and in view of Christ Jesus appearing, I give you this charge. Presence. But if you don't stay connected, you're not present with him. Even though he's here. See, it's two. It's a relationship. Then Moses said to him, in verse 15, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up, up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you've asked because I'm pleased with you and I know you by name. Then Moses said now show me your glory. Mm -hmm. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, yes. the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Mm -hmm. But he said, you cannot see my face, no. for no one may see me and live. Mm -hmm. Then the Lord said, there is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. Mm -hmm. And when my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I pass by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see that my back, but my face must not be seen. Wow. Oh man, that gets you goosebumps. Would you, make, would you just trip out if you were Moses? I'd be scared to death to even look. Mm -hmm. But to see the back of God's presence. And this scene features one of the conversations between Moses and God. The words of Moses do not reflect an arrogant boldness but or a lack of godly reference. He's just like, oh my gosh, I need you. I can't go. These guys aren't going to believe me. How can I change anybody? That's how some of us feel times, right? How can I change anybody? God says, I'm with you. Just strive to have the faith and the, and the character of Jesus and try to and believe I'm here and don't worry about the result. Just behave and act. Let the power of God continue to change you, not to show off. Just know I'm here. It doesn't matter. If they, if they don't respond right, that's their problem. I'm here. It's not like I'm not working. They're just not seeing it yeah. yet. Yeah. Or they're seeing it and going out of want. Mm -hmm. You know, the godly words of Moses represent a confidence in prayer which is only achieved when one is earnestly searching for the heart of God. You know, Moses was claimed to be the most humble man on earth. He actually wrote it himself, but he was still humble. <laughs> the Spirit wrote it. But you know what I mean? I, that, it's not like I said, he, he, didn't, he didn't write, oh yeah, God, I'm going to say I'm humble. No, God probably told him to write that. He goes, he probably, you know, if God, could you imagine if Alfonso writing this? God said, I'm going to write you a little something. Okay, Fonzo, write this, and then, and then Fonzo just adds this in parentheses, and I'm the most humble man on earth. And Kenji's wife's sitting there looking at him going. <laughs> so you, you know God did that. But it does say that Moses was the hum most humble man on earth. Wow. Bob says, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and lift you up. God opposes the proud. 
prideful. So we see that that's what he was doing. And you know, if you look at David, Moses, and other Daniel, and these other men that even David, that some of the men that sinned greatly, David, I mean, Moses committed murder. Now you could say it was self-defense, but it was there was already there was already safety. He just went out and took him out. The guy whipped him and he, he lost him, but he had to go. What I'm trying to say is these men were capable of great acts of violence, yeah. just like any of us are. Yeah. But these men turned around. And these men had their talks close to God. And you can see they were just men. The key is humble. Yes. The key is submissive and respectful to one another out of submission to Christ. To be grateful, not be ready to fight your position, but be open. And, and then when you speak to each other, speak as though you really were to think twice. Because you are just as much in the seat of judgment as this brother is. But you're helping this brother. So you're not coming with the content. Well, I'm scared for you. Why? And so that's why some of us still have trouble discipling each other. You know what discipling is? It's, it's loving the guy more than you love the guy. It's going, dude, we're friends and we're real buddies. But this behavior right here, I, I noticed. I don't know. Uh, are you okay? Or how's your purity? Well, it's okay. Well, that, what's that mean? What do you mean okay? I'm going to keep digging and I'm, if you ask me how my purity is, I'll tell you. Don't, don't worry. I'll just go, oh, no, no, no. no you, go, are you what's that mean? Have you been pure? I'll say, yeah. How are you doing with your eyes? Yeah, I've been, I've been good. I've, I've not, well, I'm not, what's that mean? I need to know. I guess I, I care. No, I, I have not gone in sites and looked at naked women or pornography. Have I ever before? Yes, to my shame. Have I been impure? Yes, to my shame. And that's why I don't mind answering you now because I don't want to go back and I am a sinner. See what I'm saying? Yeah. So I get more distance when I talk about my sin. I keep it distant because it reminds me how much the grace already had to be spilled for me before. As a Christian. So it gets me stronger. And I'm not saying, I wish I could say I'll never do it again. And I mean I will never do it again. But I, I can only depend on God. Yeah. But I can tell you there's no patterns of sin in my life. Amen. That's what we're talking about. Yeah. Come on, brother. Moses needed the Lord to reassure him that he, Moses, was truly the man chosen to lead the people. However, are you confident when you get ready, when you make Jesus Lord? You know, Cindy got baptized, Roberto's wife, on Sunday at the marriage retreat. It's awesome. You guys know Roberto, right? He's working on his schedule, and Travis and I are going tomorrow to study with him. And at the marriage retreat, no one put pressure on this guy. He asked lots of questions. And, you know, that's what I really preach about Cindy. Because when we study with him, you don't just do it as a married couple. And sometimes the wife can almost feel like, but she understood in front of him, this is my relationship with God. And we even talked the cost. I said, you know, in front of her, because I'm working. I said, uh, and Fred's done a great job too. And, and Travis and, and the other brothers. But I... Uh, I just said, you know, Cindy, this is your relationship with God in front of Roberto because we were counting the cost with her in front of him because I figured that's a good idea. He's studying. He should hear it. And I just said, you know, uh, you're, you're making a vow that Jesus is Lord before your husband. That means that you, you, you're going to submit to your husband in everything except if he calls you to do something that will cause you, call you to sin against the Lord. Mm -hmm. Then that's no. And, of course, Roberto won't do that. But I said, you have to know that. So it's not about if he doesn't want to go to church anymore. You don't. No, you will serve God. As for me. And she said, yeah. And, and Roberto just watched. So then on the retreat, when she was getting baptized, he got up and shared about her. And he said, I'm proud of her. And she's already been changing with them. Because in a marriage, it's hard to tell your spouse you're becoming a disciple. Well, not a spouse if you're faking it. Because at home, they're going to sound yeah. and see nothing yeah. different, pal. You're going to church and fired up. Yeah. No. And, and they were talking. You know, they were talking. It was good. She was humble. And uh, he said, I'm proud of her. And then he said something like, and, 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 and I'm going to be baptized. Not, what did he say? I'll soon follow. And I'm soon going to follow. He just said it out loud for all marriage. And no one put pressure. He just, because we know he's getting it. There's yeah. no pressure. It's his decision. He has to continue to make the change. But we were, we were all filled with joy and screaming every day. Because you know what it means when someone gets it. Because you know what it meant when you got it, right? Yeah. It's so special. It's so special. So... We look at this, we look at this, that uh, uh, Moses appeared to ask the Lord for a helper. You notice that? And he, he says, whom, whom, whom you will send me in 33, 12. Look at verse 33, 12. It says, then the Lord said, there's a, uh, excuse me, 12. It says, uh, Moses said, I, I've been telling you, Lord, lead these people, but, but you have not let me know whom you will send me. So remember he's saying, look, I, I need you to help me. I need you to give me a helper. He's saying that. And look what he says here. 
Uh, God's answer is this, was simply, my presence shall go with you, in, in verse 15. And it doesn't mean that Aaron wasn't there. It doesn't mean that we need to, we need to be Timothys for each other. And I'm so proud of Aaron. I really uh, am grateful. Uh, I've always been grateful for Aaron. But just, you know, in the last month or so, he made a statement. And him and I, we're, we're just, we just, we clicked right from the beginning. Did we, 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 you loved what I loved. We were just so, we were like identical twins. They go, man, Aaron, you remind me just like Chris Klobuk. And everybody said, Aaron, uh, uh, Chris Klobuk, you remind me of Aaron. No, we're completely different. But he's a godly man. And what we had to do is work out our, 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 our way of uh, understanding each other. And Chad would get in there and I'd go, Chad, can you help us? We both be standing like this at times. And that's humility. And he was too, because I was like, I know the guy means well and he knows I mean well. But we're, and so sometimes you got to be willing to get another brother in there and go, help me connect. Yeah. Don't be prideful. Because sometimes, even though we have the Lord, we come from different backgrounds and stuff. I mean, you may not get me, I may not get you. But his, I appreciate him so much. He stood up and said, I'm trying to be a Timothy to Chris Colbeck at the campus ministry. That's humble. To an imperfect Chris Klopek. Why? Not because of me. He's saying, I trust God that Chris Klopek's the evangelist put here. So it's a trust each other. Doesn't mean we don't help each other, love each other. But that is a huge heart difference. Because, you know, until you really can give your whole heart, you, you haven't shown God what you can do yet. Right? And I'm just so proud of him because he just, when I called him, not even a waiver. I got this, bro. Not in, not in cockiness. I said, you got a sermon? I was even gentle because he works full time. He goes to school full time. I said, bro, this is a little bit late notice. Are you able to preach? He goes, yeah, I can do it. Just come. That's a godly man. I appreciate it. Well, good job. <laughs> Moses then needed. So, so can you guys say that God's presence with you is enough for any situation? Because yeah. he says, one, go make yourself. When you're baptized, he says, surely I'll be with you always to the end of the age. And if it wasn't Jesus saying that, I'd say, I'm all for that. Just don't call me Shirley. That. <laughs> but surely I'll be with you. You guys got to think about that. That's disciples. Jesus says he's with you always. Mm -hmm. Not sometimes. Even when you're in sin, he's still there going, I'm grieving. I'm grieving. Even with George and Michelle. They are our brother and sister. And I want to say this as I close out. This is God's direction. You see the scriptures. Mm -hmm. This is not any looking down. This is prayer and hope they see when they're outside that it's lonely, it's hard, and what was I thinking? And then hopefully they don't need to go more into their sin because they were already continuing to sin in the body of Christ. Yeah. Now God exposed it. So hopefully this time period will help them come to their senses and come back. And there's no records of wrongs. It's just praise God. Here's the ring, this fat. Let's get the barbecue going. Here's the rub. Let's just get... just. I'll probably learn from you. When I study the Bible, I learn from people. I see their hearts so broken. I go, wow. I, that's why I love studying the Bible people. Don't you guys? Because it reminds you. When they get cut, it brings you back. You go, man, Jesus died for us. Yes. Amen. Yeah. So Moses needed to be assured, reassured that he had the Lord's favor, which is grace. Are you sure and feel great about grace? Godly sorrow <coughs> leads to repentance which leads to salvation and leaves no regret. Yeah. Wow. If there's regret, Chad, no more telling yourself that you didn't do a good message. Because I told you you did a good message. He keeps Come on, Chad. Come on, Chad. Oh, could have been better, I'm sure. Everything we could have been done better. <laughs> Myself, I'm just I'm kind of kidding, but we all could do something better. Yeah. But when you're, yeah. when you're really going, God, I did my best. Is there anything else? Then he goes, you're awesome. And if there's sin that comes up, you go, God, forgive me. I'm sorry. You get touched. And when you really mean it, I, I, I really see it. I'm sorry. Boom. Now you just move forward like it never happened again because you're striving that to live like it's not going to happen again. See what I'm saying? So there's no, there's no shame. There's no stuff on you. So the phrase found favor in your sight and the equivalent types is repeated several times in this exchange that we just read about Moses. Found favor in my eyes. Guess what? You, as a disciple of Jesus, have found favor. In Jesus' eye. And did you sin today? Yes. And I'm sure you repented, or you're going to repent tonight. You found, you're still in favor. It's grace. That's why he says, don't let the sun go down. Understand, time is telling me that you're not taking me serious, and I love you and want to forgive you, so why aren't you getting open? It's got to be pride, shallow relationship with God. You're not moved by your sin, or your pride, you're, you're, you're afraid to be, you're afraid of man more than God. Mm. 
So Moses knew that his favor, which is grace, was necessary to know God's name. Moses asked that his favor be assured him by a pledge from the Lord that he would grant his presence in the impending journey that he goes on. This the Lord graciously promised to Moses in verse 17. And we read it again. And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you ask because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. If you are walking in the grace, striving to show God that you honor him and love him with your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and the good days and the bad days, when you're not doing that well spiritually, and you show him that the most important thing is to, to, to be open and get help, have people hold you accountable if you're continuing to sin, you can say the same thing because it's not about earning it. You can say, you can say, I am. I know God is with me, not because I deserve it, because he found favor, which is grace, and he knows you by name. Mm -hmm. Charles, Mel, big boy, Wondell, yeah, Wondell King, <laughs> Shane, by the way, Shane's leaving this week, and I hope you guys are worried, your, your brother's in our prayers, his brother, unfortunately, was shot and killed last week, I'm so sorry, bro, and we're praying for him and comforting him, he's going to the funeral in Jamaica, that is intense. So please be praying for him on his trip that he'd be safe. And that's just, there's just no way to hand, you just got to go in that and just pray for him to have the words and the wisdom and the love. Nick, God's favors on you and he knows you by name. He even calls you Nicholas. He refers to the angel, hey Nicholas, look, I get a kick out of it. Mm. And then Chamba, he calls him uh, David, Sampa, Chamba, and then sometimes he calls him Nicholas, but he still loves it. <laughs> so guys, honestly, I hope you're heightened about this, this, this walk we have. The God Almighty who created the universe knows you by name. Yeah. His favor's on you if you're righteous. And just understand this. Deceit is never good. No. Say it again. Deceit is never good. Mm -hmm. Whatever you do, if you say because you want to hurt someone's feeling, you don't want to let mom hurt, that's never good. You can never justify deceit by protecting someone's feelings. You're in sin. Deceit is Satan. It's his language. So if there's deceit in here and there's unconfessed sin, you should get on it now. Don't go home after hearing a message like this holding your sin in. Because God has made it very clear from this word. He lives in unapproachable light, but he invited us in. We are in the light. We will see him when we go to heaven. And fight for the light or die. And I'm keeping the lights on. And I need all the brothers around me, like I'm going to be around you, because this is a collective and singular effort. If we're going to show the world, Orlando and everybody else, that we're not better. But we are standing up to live by the truth and the whole truth, nothing but the truth of Almighty God and the grace of Jesus Christ. And God be glory. Amen. Amen.